I planted these swales in March last year and thought I'd make a short how-to video. In order to lay out a swale, it helps to have a topographical map. Um, you can think of swales as topographical lines because the swale is uh, a ditch on contour and topographical lines are on contour as well. Um, so that's why a topographical map really helps. Another tool that helps is Google Earth. It gives you a real good sense of the shape of your land um, that you couldn't get just from a topographical map. Um, another helpful feature on Google Earth is the ruler. You can use this to measure the length of your fields, um, to estimate row length, um, space between rows, your total row feet. Yeah, it's, it's definitely useful when you're calculating how many feet between trees. So let's start by sketching some lines. You want to start your lines where the the terrain is the steepest or where the lines are closest together. In this case, that's at the bottom. And then you're going to work towards the flatter areas where the lines diverge. So let's start here where the lines converge, um, where that little orange arrow is at the bottom. And we'll, we'll start by drawing a line. And it's just an estimate. It's just an estimate of what would this map look like if there were more topographical lines. Um, and then between those existing lines, you can add more. Now the reason you start where the lines are closest together is because that way your lines don't get pinched together. If you were to start where it's flatter, if you were to start in, in just a random area, you're going to have the problem that where the terrain gets steeper, your rows become pinched together. Um, and here you can see what it actually looked like as, as opposed to just a sketch, although I sketched it last year on paper, um, and I just did this sort of revisionist sketch. Once you get out into the field, it helps to have a, a tool to find the level, and you can use an A-frame. People like the A-frame -frame because it's cheap. Uh, it's a common permaculture tool. The site level is a little faster. It's basically just a site with a spirit level in there and a mirror so that the bubble is superimposed on on this site, on the end of the site. So you look through the site and you can see the bubble there. And when that bubble is right in the center line of the site, what you're looking at is dead level to your eye level. Um, so to lay out these swales, I cut a number of stakes. You're gonna need quite a few that are at least as tall as you. You stick that stake in the ground and tie a ribbon on it at your eye level. And then you walk down the row turn around, look back through the site, and when you've got that bubble and the site and the ribbon all aligned, where you're standing is level to where that stake is. And you can put another stake in the ground. Or you can tie a ribbon to corn stubble if, you, if you're in a cornfield like I was. Or you can tie a ribbon to whatever's there. You don't need all your stakes to be eye level, but when you can't see that initial eye level ribbon, then you need to mark another, put another, tall stake in the ground and tie another one at your eye level. And the next step is excavating. I rented an excavator for a week and I had never driven an excavator before. Um, so it's definitely doable. If you've never driven an excavator and you want, you're thinking about doing a project like this, go for it. You can definitely do it. Um, a week is enough time to learn how to, to run an excavator and to accomplish what you need to do. Um, a day wouldn't be. You would need you need a, a couple days before you start to feel proficient. Um, there's two ways to dig. In this video, I'm digging going backwards. So the treads are, are driving across the corn. They're never going across the swale and then digging behind. I prefer this method because it's faster and because you can leave a nice bowl shape 
And it's easier for beginners because it doesn't have to be perfectly, you don't have to leave a, a perfectly flat grade. Yeah, I would recommend this, that you dig going backwards or it's flat and where you're able to. Now, when it starts to get steeper, the excavator is going to become more unstable. And that's why when it, in steeper areas, it's better to dig in front of you and to drive into the cut. Um, this is more time consuming because it's, it's more fussy to get a completely fat, flat grade but um, it's, it's necessary. It's the safe way to do it. It's also harder for beginners to make that grade completely flat. It was hard for me and definitely slower than, than digging backwards. Also, if you want to use your swales as a road or a path for a cart or a four-wheeler or something with wheels, it's a good idea to dig in front of you and drive into it. That way you're leaving a, a level surface. You can see from these pictures the difference in the swales. Uh, the difference in the finish from swales where I dug in front and swales where I dug behind. And once all your swales are finished, if you don't put seeds on the soil, nature will seed something for you and it probably won't be what you want. I seeded a, a mixture of perennial and annual rye, festolium, clover, although next time I do it, I'm going to use more clovers um, and less grasses in the mix. And yeah, this I had to do this for all those swales, however many row feet it was. I, I want to say it was close to 4,000. So almost a mile of, of swales of doing this. I raked the swale smooth, threw some seed down, and raked the seed in. The seed establishes much better on the mounded swale, the mounded part of the swale than it does in the ditch. Um, because that mound or the berm is loose soil, generally topsoil, and the ditch part is compacted from the bucket, from the excavator, and it's subsoil. And your next step is to plant trees. There's lots of uh, videos out there on how to plant trees. I used a dibble bar, and had some help from my neighbor, Larry, who has a tree farm. Uh, he lent some dibble bars and he was very generous with his time and showed me how to, to plant trees. This is the first time I'd done this. Uh, one thing that I used and that worked very well for me was a mycorrhizal root dip. If you're not familiar with mycorrhizal, um, it's basically mushroom spores that you're uh, inoculating your roots with or mushroom spores that you're, you're dipping your roots into. And the fungi and these trees have a symbiotic relationship. The trees give them sugars, um, and the mushrooms, the fungi, search out nutrients. My percent success rate so far, year one, is close to 99%. Um, at least the trees and tubes it's over 99% success rate. The trees that aren't in tubes, uh, it's a little lower. Besides mycorrhizal root dip, I also mulch 90% of the trees in the field. This is important because the cornfield is extremely sterile. There's very little organic matter left in the soil. And this also keeps the grass down and reduces competition around the tree. Um, and it will the mulch will slowly break down and feed the soil. And mulch is something you need to keep reapplying at least once a year. Um, another thing I haven't done but would like to do is make compost tea and apply that to the trees. That's cheap and extremely effective. Much like the root dip, you're inoculating the soil with all sorts of life, and that's a good thing. Tree protection. Where I live, there's two predators of trees, deer and voles. Let's start with deer, which I planned for, before we talk about voles, which I did not plan for. I consider two means of protection from deer, electric fencing and tree tubes. And in the end, I settled on tree tubes for a number of reasons. I'll briefly talk about electric fencing. I had ordered everything to fence this field, which is a very large field, as you can see, and I was going to fence it with a two-dimensional, a three-dimensional electric fence. 
which basically means two rows of fencing, one on the outside and one on the inside. If you Google 3D deer fencing, you'll see images of what I mean. And a lot of these use one strand on the outside and two or three strands on the inside. I had ordered enough fencing to do two strands on the outside with five foot fiberglass poles and three strands on the inside with seven foot fiberglass poles because I really wanted to make sure it was secure. Deer fencing is sort of an all or nothing approach. Um, either it's gonna keep all the deer out or they're all gonna get in. I didn't like it for that reason, that it's all or nothing. And on very large scale plantings, your fence is much more vulnerable because your deer are going to come in contact with your fence much more. For example, your fence might cause them to have to go a quarter mile out of their way, in which case they're more likely to try your fence. Now, if your planting is smaller and it's out of the way and the deer can walk around the fence easily and it doesn't affect their movement, they're less likely to try to jump over it. But this field that I was going to plant would definitely have interrupted their movement and they would have been very likely to try it. And I live in Mexico, so for all those reasons, I decided it was not a good use of money. And I went with tree tubes. I could talk for 10 minutes about tree tubes and I'll, I will make a separate video about them. If it's something that really interests you, you can pause the video right here and read this slide that I prepared. One, two, three. There they go. One, two, three, four. There's another one hanging on there. Five, six. Oh my goodness. Seven. How many bulls are in there? My daughter and I uncovered quite a few voles nests in late fall. This was oh late October, early November. In a few of the tubes, the voles had built their nest waist high, literally making tree houses with fluff like cattail, milkweed, thistle seed fluff. It seems like the best way to get rid of voles is to keep the grass short around the trees. Maybe mulch can help with this, I'm not sure. There's videos and information out there about using hardware cloth and spiral wraps to protect your tree trunks. I had kind of hoped that the tree tube would protect it, but as you can see, they can get up in the tree tube. So I may have to double wrap them, and I will probably do that with the grafted trees. The grafted trees are the ones I'm worried about, more so than the seedlings. If it's winter, that tree should re-sprout in the spring, and it will be the same seedling tree that it was the year before. But if a vole chews through a grafted tree, well, re-sprouts is no longer the graft. You've lost that $30, $40 grafted tree. Well, re-sprouts is the rootstock. Anyway, time will tell with the, with the tree tubes what happens. I'll be back in Ohio in a month. I'm anxious to see what's happened to these tubes. About a month after the trees and grass and clover were planted, we received a huge rainstorm, uh, close to three inches, the type of rainstorm that hits once every several years. So it was an interesting test run to see how the swales would handle so much water, especially without any roots or plant life established. So it was a nice trial run to see how they, how they work. And I put together a video of that that's not edited, it's just me talking and walking.